Hello again, everyone. I'm Dr. George Simon, and welcome to another edition of the new Character Matters program. This is the program where we talk about what I consider to be the defining issue of our time, the character crisis that we have faced for several decades now, and that has become so problematic that it affects every aspect of our lives, especially our relationships, including our intimate relationships. And in my books, and in my many articles on the blog at drgeorgesimon.com, I do my best to explain how we got here, why we're here, and what we can do to turn things around. And I especially talk about why so many people experience frustration and heartache, additional heartache, and sometimes additional trauma when they seek help. You see, character disturbance of all types wasn't always this prevalent and wasn't always this serious. Character mattered at various points in our time, and at sometimes it mattered more than anything. So we devoted time, energy, and attention to forging character in our children. We also knew what values and principles needed to be instilled and, more importantly, taken to heart and embraced by individuals if they were to become responsible adults with character integrity. But we've lost our way on this, and we're paying the price. So many times, the problems that come to the attention of mental health professionals don't have very much to do with a person's inner wounds or insecurities or unconscious fears, but rather their poorly developed character. And folks always ask me, well, th is there any hope? And I always have the same answer. It depends. The one thing that you will not find prevalent on the internet or in many of the books out there today that all have something valuable to say is you won't find, you won't find an acknowledgement of how vast the spectrum of character disturbance is. Character dysfunction is the phenomenon of our day, but it varies as to type and degree. And not all individuals, for example, who have narcissistic traits in their character are the same. The spectrum is broader than most authors and commentators will tell you. And in my book, Character Disturbance, I try to lay out the vast spectrum, what to look for, how to tell where someone is on the spectrum, and especially how to get the right kind of help. So the answer to the question of whether or not anyone with character dysfunction of some type can change, the only truthful answer is it depends, and it depends on a lot of things. First of all, it depends on the type of character dysfunction that the person has and how serious that character dysfunction is, how deeply ingrained it is. And then even more importantly, once you know both the nature and severity of someone's character dysfunction, it matters how one tries to intervene, because absolutely none, I'll repeat that, absolutely none of the therapeutic methods that were devised and are appropriate for dealing with the phenomenon we call neurosis, which is struggling with inner unconscious fears, causing a lot of internal strife and anxiety, maybe manifesting itself in various symptoms and psychosomatic complaints. The techniques devised for that kind of problem don't work. They have no place as an intervention for character dysfunction. 
So the problem is twofold when folks are seeking help. One, you have to size up the situation correctly. And that's hard enough. And then you have to intervene correctly. That's even harder. So many folks, well-meaning folks in the helping professions, waste time and energy, just like relationship partners do, waste time and energy trying to get the disturbed characters they're dealing with to see what they already see, to give them insight that they already have. The problem isn't that they don't see. The problem is that they disagree, just as I say in my workshops, that nice little rhyming phrase. They disagree with the basic tenets of decency. They've adopted a style that they think works for them, a way of operating in the world that they're comfortable with, that they like. And you're not going to convince them to change it with talk. But if you have any kind of a relationship with them, and they're not so serious that you need to just run for the hills, what's really necessary is enforcing the boundaries and the limits so that they don't run over you. And last week, I began talking about certain personalities that I call the aggressive personalities. Personalities that go far beyond narcissism. Narcissism is a quality that's present in all all manner of character dysfunction these days, and for a lot of reasons. But there are some individuals who go way beyond their passive disregard for other folks, to wanting to dominate, to control, to win in every situation, to emerge the victor in every life contest. And they're different from assertive personalities who respect and observe boundaries and limits, and who have some concern for and empathy for others' legitimate rights and needs, they go far beyond assertiveness to ruthlessness, to not caring who gets hurt. All that seems to matter is maintaining the position of power and control in a relationship. Many times you don't find this out until it's too late. And that's really one of the two main purposes that I wrote in Sheep's Clothing. I wanted to expose a certain personality type, a covert character type. I hear the term covert narcissism bandied about these days. Oh my goodness. It's pretty hard to, to hide selfishness, especially on a repeated basis. It's pretty hard to hide self-centeredness, grandiosity, thinking I'm all that, projecting a know-it-all image, an image of greatness. Very hard to hide those things. But what some individuals who are inherently narcissistic, but who also go beyond that with the will to dominate and control, what some individuals are good at is cloaking both their nature and intent, using certain tactics to induce what has commonly come to be called the gaslighting effect. Playing the victim when you call them on something, casting themselves as the victim and that they're only trying to defend themselves against your attack when in fact they are the attacker. They are the ones striving to dominate and control, but they want to cast themselves differently. And in your gut, you, you sense that they're doing that, but you can't objectively back it up, especially if they're convincing, if they sound adamant in their assertions. This is what induces the gaslighting effect, makes you feel crazy, makes you doubt yourself, which is the intent of the tactic. And in my book, In Sheep's Clothing, I talk about all the other tactics as well. 
that help induce the gaslighting effect and help manipulate you into caving in to seeing things their way, to giving them their way, which is the whole agenda. So rightfully, I call these folks covert aggressors because that's the appropriate label. Those of you who listen to my podcast know that I'm a stickler for terms. And I have to say, with all due respect to my colleagues in the various helping professions, especially in the field of mental health, no terms get abused and misused more egregiously many times than by clinicians, by those who should know better. I'll give you just a couple of examples. Acting out, which has become synonymous with misbehavior, and it's not, not even close. And yet I hear that term bandied about so loosely by so many. It's lost its original meaning because it has become synonymous with misbehavior. Passive aggression is another one, poorly misunderstood. It has a meaning. I talked about that in an earlier program. Denial. Oh, my goodness. It's become synonymous with lying. Denial is nature's wonderful way of protecting someone from unbearable emotional pain. And it's not conscious. And so many times, clinicians and other folks assert that somebody is still in denial about something. What they really mean is they haven't decided to fess up to their misconduct. Why do I care about these things so much? Well, because seeing things clearly is the very beginning of personal empowerment. That's true both in the therapy room and in your relationship. Once you see what's really going on and what's happening, you're on the way to getting a new life. And the same thing is true in the therapy room. But if you miscast what's happening and why it's happening and what's really at the root of it, you're in a one-down position. Whether you're in a relationship or you're a person trying to affect change. And that's why I do what I do. And that's why I've written what I have written. And so I appeal to you. It's more important than ever. This is not just shameless self-promotion. Avail yourself of all the books. Refer them to your friends. And to demonstrate that it's not just all about the promotion of the work, if you don't feel like you can do that, there's hundreds of articles, tons of free information available on the blog at drgeorgesimon.com. The URL is at the top of the screen there. And in the post that will be released today, I'll have a link to an interview that I gave with a wonderful counseling service in Colorado uh, that you can access and hear me talk more about these matters. So until next time, on the next edition of the New Character Matters, I'm Dr. George Simon. Thanks for tuning in. Take care.